Impressive. Oh. Okay, so today we'll be talking about public key cryptography. Um, before I start doing that, any questions? Right. Uh, I'm curious how familiar you are with public key cryptography. First question, have you ever used it? For example, have you ever visited a website where it had HTTPS in the URL? <laughs> so, uh, okay, so you've used public key cryptography. Um, so, in fact, when you visit a website where it says HTTPS, or if you use the SSH program on your computer, um, which are using the same libraries under the hood, SSL, then let me show you a link to a discussion enumerating what it is actually doing. So this is a long discussion about how SSL works and so on. And somewhere down here it lists, let's see, right here. So, uh, okay, well, I don't want you to look too closely at this, but the question that's being asked here is, how does HTTPS work? How does SSH work? How does this, what happens when you connect to a website for the first time? And uh, you'll see words up there like 50 Hellman, um, RSA appears right here. Um, and these initials, these are actually abbreviations for people's last names. These describe uh, really some uh, very simple seeming tricks involving arithmetic modulo n, which are used every single time you ever type in HTTPS colon slash slash in your browser. It's because of these tricks involving arithmetic modulo n that you have any trust at all using, say, Amazon.com. Um, if you, well, just instead of being theoretical, if I go right here, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to show you what happens when I say connect to Amazon.com. So I don't know if trace routes, yeah, trace route, trace route six. Hmm. I'm going to connect to a computer and then trace the route from me to Amazon.com. So anytime a message goes from, say, that computer in Belfort to Amazon.com. It's going through something like, I don't know, 20 different computers along the way. And that traffic, lots of little packets are sent. There's no, uh, the raw traffic doesn't have any encryption at all. It's just packets going along. And if along the way, at any point, somebody uh, is listening in, they can see everything that's happening both ways. And it's not really that hard to imagine somebody could set up something so they could listen to all this traffic. Um, you could go out into the hall and find the Wi-Fi router and maybe stick something on the other side of it. Like you could do that right now if you had the right hardware, and then you could listen to all the traffic that goes through the Wi-Fi router on from my laptop. So um, it's you can't trust that everything that's going over the internet from where you are to somewhere else is uh, automatically safe without doing some additional work. Unfortunately, there is a lot of additional work that's done, and that's what I'll talk about today. Okay, so um, the, I'll talk about both of these, Tiffany Hellman and RSA, and then we'll uh, implement each one, because they are very easy to implement in Sage with just a few lines of code. Um, so first, there's something called the Diffie Hellman Key Exchange. This is, the, this is a way of agreeing on a secret in full view of other people. So uh, you can have a communications channel like the internet or telephone or whatever, where two people can talk with one on each end, and other people can listen in on everything that happens. And even though other people are listening in on everything that happens, these two people will be able to agree on a secret that nobody else can figure out. 
So, and it just involves some basic arithmetic modulo n. It was invented in the 1970s, and up until that point in time, there was no protocol like this at all. There were thousands and thousands of years in which all kinds of ridiculous and things happened involving you know, everything from tattooing a message on your head and growing hair to uh, all kinds of crazy ciphers to you know, handcuffed stuff to your wrist to probably lots of people died and you want to know what happened to a lot of people as a result of not having some technique like this. But somehow, strangely enough, some people, Diffie and Hellman, came up with an amazing little idea which made it possible to securely have it so that I can agree on a message with you. And it's the entire thing will just involve us shouting numbers back and forth across the room. Everybody can hear the numbers as we shout. But suddenly, I know a secret and she knows a secret with nothing ahead of time. Like, we don't know each other's name. We don't know anything about each other. And we can still share a secret. Where the secret might be something like a, a random looking thousand digit number. And that's a really useful thing to have. If we can agree on a thousand digit number and it's the same one, then we can send very securely a message. I could, for example, take a message and encode it as a sequence of letters. That would be stupid, but I could encode it as a sequence of letters, and each letter I could shift it by the nth digit of our 1,000-digit number. And there's no way you crack that, because it looks completely random after shifting it, since the digits of the number are totally random. So we could encrypt a 1,000-letter mes message that way. Um, there are a lot of other ideas that go into using a shared secret to send a secret message um, or to encrypt a message. And that's a completely different topic. Um, typically, with all these, with the uh, whole crypto business, what happens is first you do something to agree on a shared secret. So when you use HTTPS in your browser, you agree on a shared secret. And then after doing that, you use a completely different method to encrypt all the additional um, stuff back and forth. Um, Sage has code for both of these steps, and they're really a completely different sort of art. Do you have a question? Somebody had a, you had a question. Yes? I was just wondering, the shape tattoo head, was there a reason? I didn't make that up. I think that happened in the old days, like maybe in Roman times. Just look at Wikipedia. You'll find stuff about this. I mean, if you want to send a secret message, one way would be to tattoo somebody's head, and then their hair grows out. And it's hard to look to see if there's a tattoo on someone's head. So then you shave the slave's head. I mean, it's a slave. So. You, say you shave their head, and you read the message. So. I mean, there's a lot of weird creative ways over many thousands of years that people have uh, sent secret messages. And none of them have been very good. Probably the, one of the best, well, the two best, I guess, in World War II were Enigma, which was, uh, you know, these, these, basically you have some code book that you type into this machine, and then you could decode and encode messages. But if somebody got a hold of that code book, you're out of luck. And the code book, you know, you'd use it for a long time. So, uh, and then there was the, the no speak Navajo. That's another way of sending secret messages because Navajo is so hard to understand. Um, so that worked really well. But this, but those are very different. Um, the amazing thing about these public key systems is you tell not only do we, does everybody hear everything we do back and forth, we can explain exactly what we're going to do. Like there's no secret. The only thing is that at some point I'm going to generate a random number which I won't show anybody. And she's going to generate a random number, which she won't show anybody. And we'll do something with it. We'll even tell you what we do with it. And then we'll just delete it. But we'll, I mean, we'll have it for a moment. We'll do something with it. But you'll know exactly what the protocol is. There's no secrets at all. You know exactly what we're doing. You just don't know the random number we have to use. That's the only thing that not everybody knows. Okay. Um, so this is just motivation for why you might want to understand the underlying mathematics. And there's, um, I mean, basically, the, the actual math involved is arithmetic mod n. By the way, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange was also invented at GCHQ, um, maybe a little bit earlier than Diffie and Hellman invented it, by uh, Clifford Cox. GCHQ is the British analog of the National Security Agency. And they have a nicer building. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to describe it. Um, traditionally, people use two people, Alice and Bob, to illustrate all these crypto systems. But uh, I will use Michael and Nikita from the TV show Nikita. There's also a Michael and Nikita from a TV show La Femme Nikita. There's also a Michael and Nikita from a movie called La Femme Nikita. 
but I will use the current running TV show. It's also good because N and M are sort of like nice letters to use in math. And here's uh, Burkhoff, who's their hacker guy. OK, so it's actually pretty short. Let me show you the crypto system. I've simplified it slightly. Uh, in that I'm, I mean, the two can be replaced by a different number here. Um, and in both Diffie-Hellman and RSA, I'm going to describe a system, but there exist incredibly stupid ways of choosing the parameters in the system, such that if you do that, it will be easy to crack the system. For example, one of the homework problems will involve the stupidest possible way of choosing the parameters in RSA, which makes it look like you're doing something clever, but you don't realize there's an easy way to crack. And uh, what cryptographers do is they learn all the they learn a whole bunch of tricks for attacking special stupid ways of choosing crypto systems, and um, then they make sure that they choose when they make a crypto system they don't use any they don't uh, not subject any of those stupid mistakes. Um, there's there are companies one is called Certicon, which um, they claim to be experts on choosing the right parameters and making a crypto system, and they will put a lot of work into it, and they've actually patented a whole bunch of prime numbers and so on. And they claim they're really good prime numbers to use, and then they sell them um, to various companies, which seems bizarre. <laughs> yes. But it happens. OK, so here's Diffie Helmet. Um, Michael and Nikita want to agree on a large random number. That's the problem. They want to both, sorry, uh, well, that's, that's what we want at the end. Michael and Nikita want a random number. And here's how they're going to agree on a random number, despite the fact that all kinds of people are trying to listen in on their communications. So, um, so for the very first thing they do is they agree on a large random prime number. So one of the two people, either Michael or Nikita, generates a random number and then finds the next prime after it. And they have their you know, thousand digit prime number. And then they just, whoever, one person chooses it and they tell it to the other person. And anyone can see this, perfectly fine. And again, there are, they, uh, they don't want to choose this number such that p minus one is divisible by a large number of small primes. They optimally want p minus one to be just twice a prime. That would be best for the purposes of using this. Um, but I won't go in, I won't worry about that for now. Okay, so that's step one. They agree on a single large prime number. The next, then the next two steps are completely symmetric. Michael and Nikita do the same thing, and it's really a very simple thing. Um, Michael just generates some random number m, and Nikita generates some random number n. And of course, there's a whole art to how you generate a random number. Um, they're really often, well, for the purposes, so there's, in your computer, there's kind of like two different types of random numbers. There's random numbers, for example, in Sage, if you type random number, it'll give you a random number, but it's, uh, there's some seed that it chooses maybe based on the clock at the startup of the program, and then it generates a sequence of random, or pseudo-random numbers. And that, those are often very useful for algorithms like primality testing and all kinds of other algorithms. Um, they are or generating random data to try to understand something statistically. But they're horrible for the purposes of making up a crypto system. Because if somebody knows right when you started your program, they might be able to tell what the whole sequence is. Um, and then there might be other uh, problems with the sequence of random numbers. So uh, computers will often also try to record more random events that are kind of more external, like um, stuff that's happening with the mouse and the keyboard and anything else they can find that isn't that's based on some number that got initialized at some point in time. Um, like uh, when you when you make one of these systems in practice, it might tell you to bang on the keyboard and move the mouse for a while to get sufficient entry. In any case, uh, somehow two random numbers are generated, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on how you do that, but you do this in a way that's really uh, should be pretty like, really random, not stupidly random. Okay, so Michael generates his random number. And what he does is he takes the number two and raises it to the power of n modulo p. So remember, that's something that you can do very quickly. In stage, for example, you type mod two comma p, and then you put exponent m, and it just instantly gives you the answer. And it does that behind the scenes, by the way. It writes m in binary, and then it does repeated squaring 
And uh, every time there's a 1 in the binary extension, it includes that uh, repeated square in the running product. And every time it's always reducing log p. So it takes only log base 2 of m steps to compute this exponent. So if m has 1,000 digits, it takes like on the order of 1,000 steps, which is very small. OK, Nikita does the same thing. Now, Michael and Nikita have two numbers that are between 0 and p minus 1. They look very random. And here's what they do. Michael just tells Nikita, in fact, everybody, 2 to the power of m. Note that Michael doesn't tell everybody m, only 2 to the power of m. And symmetrically, Nikita tells everybody 2 to the power of n. OK, so at this point, Michael knows something special. He knows m, and everybody knows 2 to the m. Nikita knows n, and everybody knows 2 to the power of n. So now, Michael and Nikita have just, a, each of them have a little bit of extra information that not everybody else has. But they don't know each other. Like, Michael doesn't know Nikita's n, and Nikita doesn't know Michael's m. But that's OK. So now the next step is that Michael and Nikita can both compute 2 to the power of m times n mod p, just by using this identity. If Nikita takes her 2 to the n, uh, sorry, if Nikita takes Michael's 2 to the m, which Michael told everybody, and raises it to the power of her secret n, then she gets 2 to the mn. If Michael takes his 2 to the, takes Nikita's 2 to the n and raises it to the power of his secret m, he knows 2 to the nm. And those are the same, just by algebra. And both Michael and Nikita can very easily compute this 2 to the mn mod p. But nobody else can easily compute it. Everybody else could compute it, but they would die first. The problem is, I mean, because you think about it, um, as far as we know, in most cases, it takes a very long time. Given, I mean, given 2 to the n and p, you can figure out what n is. Just try n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. But if p is a thousand digit prime, that's a lot of n's to try. And there are, in fact, better approaches. Um, there's an algorithm called the baby step giant step algorithm that will do that will find n in time square root of p and space square root of p. But that's no good. If p is a thousand digit prime and you have to use 10 to the power of 500 you know, megabytes of memory, then you're out of luck. So you can't do that. So um, it's funny. I mean, there's an easy algorithm that would find it, but it would you can compute how long it would take, and it would take uh, 10 to the 500 years, which is a long time. The universe will not last that long. OK, so there you are. They have now agreed on a secret, and then they can use this to send messages back and forth. And this very procedure that I've just shown you it seems very simple, exactly what is actually happening when you connect to a website and you type HTTPS in your browser. These random crimes are being chosen, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of. Um, there are a lot of like little subtleties to this that you might not at first think about. For example, you might be able to get some information about n if you know how long it takes to compute 2 to the n mod p. So you have to uh, worry about making it so that, like you might think of a clever algorithm that can compute 2 to the n more quickly if n has you know, less ones in it, but you want to make sure that the actual time is uniform. So for example, um, there's this guy, Montgomery, over at Microsoft Research, who uh, has written an arbitrary precision integer arithmetic library that is included in Windows. And it's very different than MPIR, the library that's in Sage. In Sage, we always try to do everything as fast as possible. In that library, they'll actually worry about trying to make things take the same amount of time, um, irregardless of the input. So if the input has a given size, the time takes the same, no matter what the input is. Because you, want, you don't want to use special tricks that might give away secret information about n, for example. So it's really weird. There's all these like, subtleties that cryptographers think about day and night, um, where just from the mathematics, there might be no way of beating the system, but there might be some other techniques that you have to worry about. And it leads to writing very strange code that you wouldn't think you would ever write. Um, oh, and let me point out why you don't want p minus 1 to be divisible by a lot of primes, since that's well, there's nothing on the slide about it, but it's kind of just it's one, it's kind of the one special attack on this that's, I think, uh, gives you a sense of how there could be lots of problems. You don't really study the area, but you might want to not make your own 
crypto system unless you really have to. Um, so you know, the whole thing really involves working with the integers modulo P, with the non-zero integers modulo P. So this object that I just wrote there, this means the numbers 1, 2, up through P minus 1, where you multiply any of these and you reduce mod P. This is a finite abelian group, cyclic abelian group. That's true. Yes. Um, and it has order P minus 1. Order P minus 1. And I don't know, some people in here might have heard of the fundamental theorem of abelian groups where write uh, a abelian group as a product of abelian groups of prime power order, where the prime powers are prime powers that divide the order order. So this group is abstractly isomorphic to product of groups C sub, uh, say, Q to the R, where our number of P minus 1 factors is a product or right, QI to the RI. Product QI to the RI. This is a prime factorization. And of course, P minus 1 is not prime because it's divisible by 2. But there are primes P, so the P minus 1 is just a product of a huge number of small primes. And in that case, this group is then a product of a whole bunch of very, very small groups. And the problem of Finding n, given that you know 2 to the n, mod p. So if you have this expression and you want to find n, that's called the discrete log problem, because after all, it's just like you're doing a log to the base of 2. It's just that you're doing it modulo p. Um, this problem, you can turn it into the same problem but in each of these cyclic groups. So if, you're, um, if your number of p minus 1 is just a product of a whole bunch of small prime powers, then you, all you have to do is solve it in each of these cyclic factors, and it solves it in the original. And that turns out to be really easy. So that's the one. That's one thing you have to watch out for, because um, it, it isn't really. Like if you choose a random prime look at factorization of p minus one, uh, you could easily end up with a prime that has a lot of small factors. Let's just try that. Um, I have no idea what will happen here, but. So, I mean, that's actually not, not so bad. I probably should do next probable prime. That's faster. Or was it, yeah, next probable prime. How can that be hard? Huh. I don't understand how that could be hard. That take more than a second. Oh, the factoring p minus one can be hard. <laughs> of course, um, it can be very hard to factor p minus one. This is a good example where um, remember I mentioned there are different factoring algorithms like trial division, the elliptic curve method. There are all these different methods that have different features. So the elliptic curve method, given a maybe thousand digit number, it'll it'll find all the numbers that divided uh, with up to say twenty digits. That's the sort of thing it does. So that's the perfect approach to trying to figure out whether or not your p minus one factors like this. You can run that, and it will tell you whether you have lots of small factors. If it doesn't, then maybe your numbers are like a couple of big ones, which would be perfectly fine. So, for example, for this one, p minus one factors like this. So, the secure, if you're using this prime, it's really no better than using a prime that's about that size with your, as far as the security of using this for diffie qualities. So you can see how. If you're going to implement this for web browsers, you're going to probably want to spend a bunch of time choosing some really good primes p and maybe hard coding those into the algorithm uh, rather than just choosing them really genuinely at random. Because if you choose them at random, you may have to do a lot of extra work to uh, be convinced that they're any good. OK, so any questions about the diffie helming key exchange? I hope the basic mathematical idea is pretty straightforward. Um, just, just this. I mean, it's really, at the end of the day, that's just remember that one little thing right there. 2 to the mn is the same as 2 to the nn. Allows you both to agree on a secret. 
Any questions about this? Yes. It was like a view target and from the discrete log problem. Is well, that's the definition of the discrete log problem. The discrete log problem is given 2 to the n by p, what is n? That is the problem. The problem is, like, if you if you start exercising it, said 2 to the n is 5744.82 mod p, tell me what n is, then you would, be, you would have been handed a discrete log problem. Uh, I'm not claiming that using the like, usual continuous logarithm function or something allows you to solve that problem. Um, did you know the already in that? Yes, the input to the problem would be 2 to the n and p, and then the output would be n. And the n is defined. I mean, the n is determined. There is an n that works. But the task of um, basically implementing a program that takes as input 2 to the n mod p, I mean, that number, and of course p as well, and output n. This is, uh, there's an algorithm that will do it that is square root of p in complexity. There are some other there's special cases, like if p minus 1 is a product of small primes, using group theory you can solve this efficiently. In general, it's believed to be quite difficult. Um, that said, there is there is another algorithm that's, uh, that involves the num something called the number field, so just like we use for factoring, which uh, is much better than square root of for solving this. And so uh, people care a lot about very fast implementations of that. But even then, if you make p really large, it still becomes incredibly hard. Um, and there's no theorem, though. For all we know, there's some super fast algorithm that solves this problem. Like, just notice, for example, it's, uh, it, it's, you can verify the answer in polynomial time. If somebody says, hey, here's an answer, you can quickly verify that it's right. So this. Um, so if p equals np, then this would be very quickly solvable because it's in np. Uh, one other thing is that if you can build a sufficiently complicated quantum computer, then you can solve this instantly. very quickly. On a quantum computer, there's a polynomial time algorithm to solve the discrete log problem. Very short. So fast on a quantum computer. If people figure out how to build really good quantum computers, then uh, that's just the whole framework in which we do all the algorithms we use for sending, like connecting security to websites and so on, and all traffic we've ever done that's been recorded by anyone will suddenly be encrypted. So, like every credit card number you ever typed online, every message you thought you sent secretly, every single thing that if it was actually recorded, and some of it was. Then it will all be decrypted. Sorry. Wait Okay. So let's implement this. And instead of just implementing it, uh, I decided that since I've done that a lot with the things that we're doing, and often when you're solving problems and trying to use Sage, you're just left with a blank page, that we will figure out how to implement Ify Hellman. Right now. So you'll see how you can go from absolutely nothing to having some code that does something. So um, I'll just very quickly list the steps again. Random p. This is a very good thing to do if you're going to implement something. Um, random n. Actually, n I did Michael first, and then p to the power of m. And 3 was random n. Oops, you're right. That would be really dumb. 2 to the power of n. Thank you. Mod p. Random n to the power of n mod p. And the secret is, I'll call it s for secret, 2 to the n m mod p. Okay. So at this point, there are various things we could type in this blank box. Um, we could either try to do this with a big prime or a small prime. We could try to write functions and classes, or we could just try to do one example with concrete numbers, either big or small, we just have to decide. So which of those many things do you want to do? Or do you want me to do? Do you want us to do? Choose. Last one. Last one, OK. So a specific example. Is that the last one? I don't even know what the last one is. Yeah, OK, specific example. All right, so the first step is a random prime p. Okay, uh, shall we have a big prime or a small prime? 
Shouldn't work with any prime, but what do you want? I can make like a 500-digit prime, or I can make a I can make you know my favorite prime, which is 3d9. So what do you want? What do you want? I got a prime. Okay, what's your prime? One six nine seven four three two one two. Three what? Three two one two. That one. Uh, and no, no, there's more. So one six nine seven four three two one two two seven nine. One more. Okay, that's prime. All right, there's our prime. <laughs> Great. Uh, now we need a random number, and this m, uh, it should be some number that's less than. I mean, technically, it's a number between zero and p minus one. But I mean, if we just choose some random number up to about p, it'll be fine. Um, we could make m using some random number generator, or I could bang on the keyboard. Either way will work fine for our purposes. Which do you prefer? I could choose your own adventure. Should I bang on the keyboard, or should I generate a random number using a random number function? Okay, banging. So I don't have to worry about, oops, I hit a zero at the beginning. Don't do that, because um, that makes the number be an octal, and then the nine there won't work. So you may run into that in Python. This will give an error watch. See, it says invalid token. I mean, basically it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so there we have an M. So I got my banging, and now mod 2 comma p to the power of m. This is what's broadcast to the world. There it is, that number right there. Uh, I'll record it in variable, um, so I don't have to copy and paste. So I'll call that 2, actually I'll just call it, uh, what should I call it? Step 2, I'll just call it step 2. OK, so now what should I do? Let's generate a random. Okay, let's just do the same thing again. Generate a random n. n. I'll use my random number generator. Okay. And now, there it is. And I'll call this step three. Boom. There it is. So now we have two random looking numbers. These are the ones that everyone can see. And it was really easy to make them. But if somebody wanted to figure out what the m was, they could do it, but it would be some work. Like they might make a for loop through all the numbers up to this big prime p, and once they got to that number, they'd suddenly see, oh, it was the right one. So that's a huge amount of effort. It would take a long time. OK, and now um, step four equals, so I will take, uh, there's two different ways to do this. So how about if I say step four underscore Michael. So this is what Michael would do. You would take one that Nikita sent out and raise it to the power of his number. Is that right? Okay. And let's see, here's what Nikita would do. Step four, uh, step, step two, thank you, to the end. Let's do it. I know the same, I claim, but actually you might as well look at them. Um, it's like a magic trick at this point. They're the same. <laughs> so Nikita and Michael are both agree on that. Very nine. Uh, that number with a lot of nines in it, they're the same. There we are. Pretty neat. OK, do you want to do anything further with this example? We don't have to, but we could. Well, you have that number. How do you make It's kind of like a totally different question um, that involves a different area of mathematics and engineering. Um, and there are a million answers to that question. And it falls into the, so what we're talking about right now is public key cryptography, so the moniker of it, public key cryptography, uh, which is an area that involves, at the end of the day, a lot of basic tricks that rely very often on this street log problem, and um, it involves a lot of number theory. So if you're a number theorist and you want to work uh, as an applied mathematician uh, outside of academia, but you still want to do number theory, then you'll probably end up doing public key photography. So it's so much number theory involved here. You would not believe how abstract and deep number theory is that goes into this. Um, the people that do, people that study public key photography often do more abstract and deep number theory than people that do number theory in academia. It's really surprising. And you'll never, never be why. This, um, and then there's another, which involves symmetric 
um, key encryption. And basically what you do with symmetric key encryption is once you've agreed on something like this, then you have to start sending messages back and forth using it. Enigma kind of is an implementation of a symmetric key encryption system because there's, like, you set all the rotors in a certain way according to some code book, and then you start encrypting messages back and forth. And there's a whole world of uh, subtlety there. So, for example, um, like, I mean, one thing is if we had both agreed on a number between 0 and 25, we could make a Caesar cipher where we shift each letter by one. But as you might know, um, Caesar ciphers are easy to crack if you have a sample of plain text and the corresponding encrypted text, you just get it. And even if you just have the encrypted text, you can do a frequency analysis and use that, you know, E is the most popular letter, and you know the frequency in which letters appear in the language, um, you can figure out what the encryption is. So in practice, you have to do all kinds of things. Like you take the message and you'll add very carefully some randomness along the way so that um, even if you encrypt the same message twice, you'll get a different encryption. So for example, uh, if somebody is spying on you, they might know that you always encrypt that the weather's nice in a certain way. So what you want to do is salt your encryption. So there's a whole world of this. There's a bunch of different um, encryption uh, product, like standards, like uh, DES, um, uh, there's a lot of them. There's a whole bunch of different acronyms that stand for uh, ways of basically taking some sequence of letters, combining them up into blocks, salting them in an appropriate way, and then shuffling them via maybe a thousand rounds of some sort of procedure that has a key, and you use this as a key, and then a way of undoing it. And you simultaneously want to make it really, really fast, but you also want to um, make it so that it's incredibly hard to undo. Uh, so these things are also often, I mean, like, called blast ciphers often. There's a lot of ways of trying to uh, make those good. There's, like, the government often has contests for you know, come up with the best block cipher according to some, some rules, and I think there was one chosen recently. Um, and there's some funny things, like, with those, you can take the entire thing and convert it into a system of um, algebraic equations. And then in theory, you could maybe solve them using Grobner bases, like figure out what the key is given a bunch of text. Um, but the systems of equations are incredibly hard to solve. And so you can only maybe attack toy problems. Yes? Isn't it an animal like uh, you encrypt a message and then it doesn't work like a random seed, where you, if you send the same message again, then it will be a different Okay. Yeah, but that's the same here. Like, if you send another message, you would uh, randomize it a little bit. And so with Enigma, your machine has a given state, and that state evolves. So if you send the same message, but your machine is in a later state, then it will uh, be encrypted differently. So yeah, you always want to do that. You never want to, at a bare minimum, anytime you're ever encrypting anything, you want to make it so that the message is, the no, knowing uh, that some input got encrypted in a certain way doesn't cause any I mean, that shouldn't give you any extra information. Um, so what if you like, uh, keep shuffling and then, you know, you see that, I mean, it's, I know it's random, but then you see that yeah. random again occurring. So if you encrypt a certain message, uh, if you're randomizing it with a certain solve, mm -hmm. so that random pattern, like, let's say if you're using the, you know, the clock, yep. uh, or the timing for that, so the next day you're sending the same message, that particular time, you get the same. Yeah, you have to watch out for things like that. Don't okay. do that. Okay. Be very careful how you choose your random numbers. Um, it's a subtle thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, one other, actually, one thing I want to point out, which is really disturbing, regarding the Diffie-Hellman key exchange and its use in actual um, encryption that you use every day, is the so-called man-in-the-middle attack, which is that if you're sending, if you're using this protocol to agree on a secret. So um, instead of going into RSA in the last few minutes, I'll talk about man in the middle for a moment. So what if you, what if instead of like actually being able to see the other person and shout or whatever, you're literally sending a message over the internet. And remember that, as I showed you just a second ago, there could be 23 or 24 different hops from you to where it's going. There could be somebody along the way that just takes your message and um, 
replaces it by a different message. And that can cause some serious trouble. Um, all you have to do in this case is, uh, so Michael would announce 2 to the m log p and send it over the wire, and the man in the middle would take the 2 to the m and replace it by his 2 to the m prime and send it on. And Nikita would do the same thing in the other direction, and he would replace the 2 to the n by some other zone chosen 2 to the n prime and send that on that way. And then at the end of the day, Michael and Nikita would think that they had agreed on a secret, but in fact they had both agreed on different secrets with the person in the middle, unbeknownst to them. And then every time Mike, uh, Nikita sends, uh, or Michael sends a secret, encrypts it with what he thinks is the shared secret, and the man in the middle then decrypts it using that secret, re-encrypts it using Nikita's secret, and then sends it on. So in fact, that person can read everything in both directions. That's pretty worrisome. And in fact, this is a real problem that, uh, I mean, in a sense, has never really been solved with looking at encryption in general. Um, there are various uh, extra things that you can add in, certificate authorities and all kinds of stuff like that to help improve on this, but the serious problem to know who you're talking to. So for example, um, like if you make a website and just start serving on port 443 using encryption and point somebody to it and it has HTTPS in the URL, um, they'll get a huge message right when they try to connect to the site which says, you should not trust this site this is probably not where you want to go, and it'll be all red. Have you ever seen that in a browser before? Um, this is uh, dangerous. And uh, the reason is because you haven't got a proper SSL certificate, which you have to get from some sort of trusted authority. Like uh, UW will produce them for you. GoDaddy will produce them for you for like $5 or whatever. So you have to pay somebody to sign some, uh, something that you do. So um, what happened, basically that gets added to your website as some file, and then um, and then uh, the person will not get that scary message. So that's one attempt, but it involves a third party. You can't sort of just solve it mathematically. You have to add in some extra person. Uh, also, if you've, I don't know if you've ever used SSH. Who here has ever used SSH on the command line? Okay, lots of people have used it. Sometimes when you type SSH to another computer, it asks you, do you really want to connect? You've never connected to this other computer before. Have you ever seen that? And you always ignore the message and say yes, right? Well, that's exactly the man in the middle problem. The idea is that you connect once, and somehow the first time you connect, you trust the connection. And then ever after, you'll know that it's the same other one. And if somebody then suddenly jumps in between you and that other computer and tries to uh, fake the connection, just as I described, then you'll get that warning again, which of course you'll ignore. But, um, if you, but in fact, that's completely useless because everybody ignores them unless they're really, really paranoid. Um, but that's that, the reason for that message being in there is exactly because of this man in the middle issue. So, okay. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to decide. It's hard, to, there's definitely not enough time to describe RSA, but we still have a few minutes. Uh, so any questions? Yes? Yes. Uh, follow up of RSA? No, oh, so historically Diffie Hellman was the absolute first okay. ever of these public key crypto systems. The first ever. And it was published, if you look at Math Signet, which is reviews of papers in math, it's amazing. The review of the paper uh, says the reviewer is not convinced. Like after describing what they claim they're doing, he actually doesn't believe that this works or would be useful. It's very strange. It's just so like, it's such a shift in the way of thinking about what's possible. Um, so this came out, and then subsequent, so Diffie and Hellman came up, came up with this, and then after that, uh, these three guys, Ravess, Shamir, and Adelman, um, they came up with a different system which solves a different problem, uh, which is better than this system in some ways, but I mean, basically it solves a different problem, but it also involves similar sorts of mathematics. Instead of working mod a single prime, you work mod a product of two primes. That you can, and the difficulty, instead of it being a problem, merely is solving the discrete log problem with the public factory. Um, actually, I'll tell you what the problem is that it solves without actually uh, showing you the algorithm. Okay, so in the uh, TV show that I mentioned, here's Nikita, and she used to work for some spy agency and then got out. And when she was there, she left some software on their computers, which she thought would be useful later on. And 
she wanted this, she wrote some software that would make it so that so people who were there, if they knew about the software, could send her encrypted messages. But they could send them without her having to be sitting there listening for the message. Basically, what if I want to what if I want to leave a program on a computer and make it so that three years later somebody can send me a secret message without me having to do something interactively with them? Remember with this, there's this interaction going on. Like to agree on the secret, both parties have to do something. Um, Pretty much every, both people really have to do something before the agreement happens. What RSA solves is this problem. This uh, person infiltrates the secret agency years later and then uses the software that she left on the computer to send her secret messages. So that problem is what gets solved by RSA. Actually, I guess I have time to show you what the, I mean, it's just a list of steps, but we won't go into, I'll review it again on Monday. But here's the, here's how it works. So uh, you want to make it so that you can leave something somewhere so that people can send you messages forever, and or can encrypt a message, which can then get sent, and that you can decrypt later. And the cool thing is having the um, information necessary to encrypt a message does not give you the information to decrypt it, like having it sitting there. So you know everything you need to encrypt a message. Once you encrypt it, it's encrypted, and if you delete the unencrypted version, even you can't decrypt it, which is really amazing that you could do that. That's totally different than what you get out of 51. Um, but that's what the RSA crypto system gives you. So here's how it works, and I will review exactly this right at the beginning of Monday. So what Nikita does is choose two random large prime numbers, P and Q, and computes their product. Easy to do, right? We have no trouble doing that. Then Nikita computes a random integer less than n and computes the multiplicative inverse of that random integer modulo the product p minus 1 times q minus 1. This should be p minus 1 times q minus 1. My parentheses are off. Sorry. So let's see how it's q minus 1 times p minus 1. Uh, p minus 1 times q minus 1. The modulus is that. So using the Euclidean algorithm, as I explained last time, it's possible to find very efficiently a d so that e times d is one mod anything you want. Okay? And now here's what it's saved. The number n, which is the product of p and q, and this number e. That's what she leaves on the computer for people to then use to send her secret messages. So anyone who looks at that, they know n and they know e. They don't know p and q though. I mean, in theory, they could find P and Q because it's just factoring n. However, it's hard to factor. So um, here's how somebody encrypts a message to Nikita later on. Uh, so the message has to get converted to a number. So if your message is really long, you'd convert it to a bunch of different numbers. And you'd really want to add in some randomness to your message all over the place so that the same message doesn't encrypt in the same way every time. But in any case, if you can solve the problem of encrypting a number and sending it, then you can solve the other problems. Uh, that's like the really hard part. So to send you a message, to send a key to a message or to leave her a message, you take a number and raise it to the power of E mod N. That's the encrypted message. Nikita can decrypt the message. All Nikita has to do is raise M to the E, which is the encrypted message that she just received, to the power of D. The result will, because e times d is 1 mod uh, this product, and uh, the group of numbers modulo n has exponent this product, as it turns out, um, this m to the ed will just be m modulo n. So all you have to do is raise the encrypted message to the power of d, and you get the decrypted message. And d is very hard to compute if you don't know p and q. Remember, to compute d, we computed the inverse of e modulo p minus 1 times q minus 1. And that requires knowing p minus 1 times q minus 1. And if you know p minus 1 and q minus, and if you know this product and you know p times q, it's really easy to find p and q. Or if you know p times, yeah, that's what I just said. And it's really easy to find p and q. So it's really hard to figure out this product without factoring it in. Possible. So that's it. I mean, it's really just, again, some simple arithmetic. There are some subtleties where uh, one stupid way to choose n would be to choose a prime p 
and then choose the next prime after p. That's stupid because p is then almost the square root of n. So if you just try numbers really close to the square root of n, you can factor. That's, by the way, how to solve the homework problem. So take the huge number n that I have and square root it, and then try integers around that, and you'll build a factor. OK, so we'll implement in this blank box RSA right after briefly summarizing it again on Monday. OK? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Huh? Oh.